it feels like family here, first and foremost. I started my career way back in 1985. And the person who actually hired me in radio is here today, my boss from several decades ago. I'd like to honor my boss, uh, Bernie Buenaceda, Burning Bernie from WBL. And I'm, I'm just honored to, to see my boss here. Also, I'd like to honor Chinky Tan. It's all because of you, Chinky. Uh, five years ago, I was seated right where my boss was seated, with my family. 1 p.m. service, Chinky Tan was here. 4 p.m., 4 p.m. service. Thank, thank you to my wife for correcting. 4 p.m. service, uh, Chinky Tan was preaching. And then when he made an altar call, I didn't care about my family because I wanted to make that decision for myself, for Jesus. So I stood up. I was, as I was walking halfway, I was tempted to look back and just see if my family followed me. All the chairs were empty. My wife and my four children. Decem uh, July 12, 2000. Uh, July 1, 2012, we surrendered our life to Jesus. And now we're accidental missionaries to the capital city of Australia, which is Canberra. Anyway, we're starting a new series called Remember This. We're looking at the book of Malachi. Malachi in Hebrew means messenger, God's messenger or my messenger. The book of Malachi is a series of dialogues between God and His people, which was sent through the, the prophet Malachi. And we want to progress God's statements so we can answer them in regards to how relevant the book of Malachi is in our lives today. Malachi is the closing book of the Old Testament. It is the last book of the Old Testament. And it's interesting to note that after Malachi, there was 400 years of silence. Uh, theolo theologians call this the intertestamental years, meaning the years between the last book of the Old Testament and the New Testament. 400 years, God was silent. The phone was on mute. And it's important to understand the importance, or the relevance of Malachi is that for 400 years, this was the message that God left to His people. This is what God wanted His people to remember. And the message is as relevant, as important, and as true to them as, to, uh, as it to us today. There's, there's not so much information told about Malachi. And all we know is that it means my messenger. But I think what God is trying to point out is that what is more important is not the messenger who brings the message, but the message of God that the messenger brings. Who among you here have favorite pastors? See, you go to a certain time because your pastor is preaching, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But God, what God is trying to tell all of us is that what is important is the message, not the person standing in the pulpit carrying the message. It's important to listen to what God is trying to tell us today. And we always have to be reminded because we always forget. That's why this is such a relevant series about being reminded. We have our cell phones, you have your notes there, you have your reminders. In Australia, we celebrate what we call Anzac Day. This is a day where we commemorate all the heroes of Australia and New Zealand who have fought in World War I for the freedom of Australia and New Zealand. And you always see these posters, lest we forget, so that the newer generations will not forget what their ancestors or what their forefathers had done so that they can enjoy their freedom. We live in a time and place where we just seem to sort of like take God for, for granted. And this is a time when the book of Malachi was written, when the Israelites were at the brink of uh, forgetting about God. They knew they were, you know, uh, taken out of Egypt in exile. They were provided for with, where they were in the desert, but they forgot all about that. So this is a time when they needed to be a reminder they needed to be reminded of, of what God wants them to know. Now, the same is true with our relationship with God. We need to be reminded because when we are faced with troubles, with trials and tribulations, we seem to forget God and what God has done for us. This is a time when the Israelites were at the brink of, you know, forgetting about what God has done for them. Just to give you a little background of Malachi, it was a time when God was giving Israel a chance to start again. They went back to their land after 70 years of exile from Babylon, and they were beginning to build the temple of God. It was a symbol of God's presence in their lives. They were so excited. They were on an all-time high, knowing that God's going to do a lot of great things for, for, for Israel. But it didn't work out that way. They expected God would restore them, but the economy was falling. It was really bad. They expected that the Messiah will be coming as, as prophesied in the Old Testament, but in reality, they were still under the Persian rule the governors of Persia. 
they expected God's manifest presence to be in their lives, but even if the temple was there, they didn't feel it. And they started to feel discouraged. They started to feel depressed. And on top of their external problems, they had internal issues as well. Slowly, this chosen people of God deviated. They slowly started disobeying God. They forgot what God has done for them. Just like a lot of us today. Don't we all feel that? Christmas is just about to start, the end of the year. We have been disappointed because of the so many things that we expected God to bring into our lives. Sometimes we, we, we fail at our relationships and we ask God, why is this happening to us? We start to get disappointed. We start to get depressed, disillusioned, and we start to be disobedient to God. How many times have we been disobedient to God this year? In the middle of disobedience, in the middle of the oppression, in the middle of the disappointments, God had a message for Israel. God has a message for His people. And the same message resonates in our society today, in our time today. And I would just like to just stand in prayer and say, Lord, we thank You for this time that we can come together today. It's not an accident that we are here, Lord. We pray that You bless the preaching of Your Word today. May it be like a sword that will pierce through our hearts and change us from the inside and help us to live the life that you have called us to live as Christians. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Malachi is a book of declarations. Four declarations or four reminders that God gave to His people. I love you. I am the great king. I will never change because that's my character. And my promises will always be there for you, for my chosen people. And today we'll start with the first promise. May I ask you to open your Bibles to Malachi chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, if you have them with you. This passage summarizes the basic spiritual problem of Israel during that time. God has shown Israel His love for them, but they doubted. They didn't trust God's love for them. They don't recognize it anymore. Verse 1, the oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi In other translations, it's called the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Why is it called the burden? It is a burden because it is the word of God. I'm standing here right in front of you with the burden so that I may be able to faithfully deliver God's message. The same burden that Malachi was carrying upon his shoulders to be able to faithfully deliver the word of the Lord. What is the word of the Lord? In verse 2, God says, I have loved you. God made a declaration. He said, I love you. He didn't say, I loved you in the past. He didn't say, I love you today. He said, I have loved you. It's an ongoing thing. God is saying, I loved you before, I love you now, and I will always love you in spite of everything. But the Israelites, they were bitter. They were angry. They wanted to see the promised Messiah. The fact that Israel questions God's love is not just a sign of their angst, but it's also a declaration or a demonstration of their distrust to the love of God. When someone says, I love you, it will take trust for you to believe that person. If you do not trust that person, you would ask him, prove it to me first. I want to feel it. Kung talagang mahal mo ko, paramdam mo sa akin, kailangan ko makita. But God is saying, I love you. And he doesn't want us to ask him, Lord, prove mo nga na mahal mo kami. Because God wants us, to trust, wants us to trust Him when He says He loves us. Now, let's go to the next verse. This is how God responded when the Israelites said, How have you loved us? Prove to us, God, that you love us. God said, Is not Esau Jacob's brother? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. I have laid waste his hill country and left his heritage to the jackals of the desert. Now, the question you might want to ask is that, why did God love uh, Jacob more than Esau? Esau wasn't devoted to God. That's the reason why. He married pagan women, and he started worshiping their pagan gods. Now, Esau represented the people who go their own way in disobedience to God. Jacob, on the other hand, was not perfect as well. In fact, he tricked his older brother Esau, who had the birthright, over a piece of meal for all the wrong reasons. But somewhere along the way, Jacob understood the covenant with God and walked faithfully in obedience to Him. So Jacob represents people who walk in obedience to God, and Esau represents people who walk in disobedience to the Word of God. In the next verse, it says, If Edom says we are shattered, 
but we will rebuild the ruins. The Lord of the host says, they may build it, but I will tear it down, and they will be called the wicked country and the people whom the Lord is angry forever. The Edomites, which were the descendants of Esau, came to destruction. They have done so many things against the will and the wish of God. One thing they did was to refuse the passage of the Israelites across their country. In fact, they have oppressed the Israelites for the longest time. They were enemies for the longest time. And God did not bless them because they were enemies of the chosen people of God. And our verse today ends with, chapter, with verse 5, which says, Your own eyes shall see this, and you shall say, Great is the Lord beyond the border of Israel. This is God's great promise of restoration to Israel. In spite of their disobedience, God is saying, I will bless you because I love you. And the nations will bear witness to this, to the glory of God that will go beyond the borders of Israel. Israel lost touch with God. They lost their signal. But Malachi's message, relevant to them, relevant to our modern times, is simply this. God is saying, the world will change. People will change. The way you feel about me will change, but I will always love you. I will never change. The greatest message of Malachi this morning is God's love for us. What is this trying to say? God is saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. It is a declaration. It is, it is not something that He will do if we do something good. It is not dependent on how we respond or how we live our lives. Regardless of who we are, God says, I love you with an everlasting love. Now, this is my question. Why is it difficult to trust God when He says, I love you? Everyone in this room is going through a season in their life. You might be in a season of waiting. You might be in a season of restoration. I don't know, but you are in a season of your life right now. And sometimes you ask, God, do you really love me? When I was pondering on this, God showed me a picture, birds on, perched on a transmission line. I remember when I was a small kid traveling to Batangas along the South Superhighway, you see like transmission lines, and I see birds up on the transmission line. I said, bakit hindi sila no? At any given point in time, there will be about 700,000 volts of electricity running from the power generation plant to our homes through those transmission lines. Bakit ang dami-dami nila, saya-saya nila, hindi sila angry birds. Pero they're there and, di ba, enjoying the view. But if a man who is grounded even comes close or touches the wire, he'll be electric- electrocuted. Magiging bonchon ka. Parang bonchon na sunog. No? So, sabi ko, Lord, what does this mean? How is this relevant to your message today? You know what he said? Joe, my love never changes. My love is like the electricity. The electricity never changes if a bird perched on it. It will never change if a man holds it. It's the same. God's love is the same. So, Lord, hindi ko pa intindihan. Ano ibig sabihin nito? The difference is based on how we position ourselves in relation to the love of God. You know what I mean? If you are grounded to the world, you will never truly experience the love of God because you are worried with the concerns of the world. But if you set your eyes on things above, like the birds, then you will experience God's majestic love and glory. That's what the picture means. Now, the challenge for us today, I believe, is the fact that God wants to have a relationship with each and every one of us. I want to challenge you because this relationship is based on how you trust God's love. The entire Bible is based on the fact that God loved mankind so much that He gave His only begotten Son to be crucified and to die for our sins. Yet while we were sinners, Christ died for us, and now we are justified by Christ's blood. And because of what He did, we now have a relationship with the Father. To be able to understand Malachi, we have to, to read and study the entire Old Testament because it's a summary of that. But I just want you to focus on one thing today. I just want to focus on one question that all of us, I hope, would be able to answer with all our hearts at the end of this sermon. Do you trust God's love? You know, for men, we would say, show me first, and then I will trust you. 
But God is saying to each and every one of us today, trust me and then I will show you. It's difficult to trust someone who just says, I will do it, I love you, without seeing proof. Tayo, we want to feel that we are loved. We want to see that we are loved before we believe that person saying he loves us. But with God, he just wants to say, if I say I love you, just trust me because I really love you. Now, the thing is, we all are struggling with the fact that God loves us. Why? Because we're looking at our lives, we're looking at our situation. God loves you in the littlest of things. It's not a chance that you are sitting where you're sitting right now today. Somewhere, someone's family is crying because that person did not wake up. The fact that you wake up, you woke up today, you're alive and sitting here, means that God loves you. God woke you up because He has a purpose for your life. You want proof that God loves you? Every ordinary thing that you have in your life is a word of God's love. Your work, your family, your car, your cell phone. The clothes you're wearing, the shoes you're wearing, the food you're eating later at lunch, it's all saying and shouting just one thing. See how I loved you? We are so blessed that we are able to sit here, wake up this morning, feeling alive and healthy and being able to listen and and commune with the church community. Now, some of you will be struggling with God's love because He took away something from you. Maybe a family member died. Maybe he took away your health. Maybe he took away your relationship. How has God loved me? We're shouting just like the Israelites. If God has taken away something very important to me. God's encouragement. Sometimes God, the blessing of God is not in the things that he gives us. The blessing of God are in the things that he takes away from us. Why? Because He knows what's best for us, because He loves us, and we just have to trust Him. So if things have been taken away from you, don't, re- you know, don't shout at God and say, Lord, why have you done this to me? Why have you taken away the things that I love the most? Because He's doing it because He loves you, because He knows what's best for you. May, you may not understand it at that point when He has taken that away from you, but believe me, God is the reason for doing that. Sometimes God allows you to stand on the edge. And you're saying, Lord, why have you pushed me to the edge of my life? I don't know what to do anymore. How has God loved me if He has pushed me to the edge? Ganun ka ba, Lord? Pag mahal mo yung tao, tinutulak mo sa gilid. Konti na lang, mahuhulog na. You see, if you are on the edge, what God wants you to do is trust Him. Trust that He loves you. Because only two things can happen if you trust God When you're on the ledge, it's either He will catch you when you fall or He'll teach you how to fly. That is if you put your trust in God. Otherwise, you'll just fall flat on your face on the ground. Sabi natin, Lord, everything is falling apart. My marriage is falling apart. My kids, my family, it's falling apart. My work, I'm losing my job. I've been struggling so hard to save up, but I cannot. I'm just living from hand to mouth every day. Everything about my life is falling apart. And then, just like the Israelites in the time of Malachi, we shout, how have you loved us, God? Nasaan yung proof? Do you really love me? This is God's encouragement for all of us. When everything is falling apart, it means that God is picking up the little pieces of our broken self and putting it together in a way that He knows is best for us. Just the way He wants it, just the way it should be. Because He loves us. Maybe God is not changing your situation because He wants to change your heart first. Or maybe God is constantly changing your situation because He doesn't want you to hold on different things, but just hold on to Jesus. Everything is falling apart. The truth of God's love is not that He allows bad things to happen. 
the truth of God's love is in His promise that He will be there with you when they happen. When Jesus asked Peter to walk on the water, Peter walked and then suddenly he got discouraged because there was such a big storm around him and he started to sink, but Jesus saved him. So they walked back into the boat, but a lot of us do not know that the storm stopped only when they reached the boat. Jesus could have snapped his finger, storm stopped, Peter is afraid, and then Peter, you can go back to the boat. No, Jesus allowed the storm to brew around Peter, but he was there with him. So if you're in the middle of a storm in your life and you feel that no one cares for you, no one understands what you're going through, not even your parents, not even your children, not even the people you love, know that God understands. He knows what you're going through. And even if you don't see Him holding your hand in the middle of the storm, He is there. Because God did not promise no storms. He promised there will be a storm, but I will be with you through the storm. So do not fret about your life falling apart because God loves you. And some of us, you would say, Sobrang dami ko nang ginawa masama sa buhay ko. I don't deserve God. I don't deserve His goodness because I'm a bad person. You look at your life 5, 10 years, 12 years ago, 20 years ago, and you see, Lord, hindi talaga eh. I'm not worthy of your love. God's encouragement. God knows every single little piece of ugly, the ugly you that is seen by people, and a whole lot of ugly use that you hide inside yourself. He sees all of that. He knows all of that, but He still loves you. Regardless. Yet while we were sinners, Christ loved us and Christ died for us because God loves us. Now sometimes, you're on the ledge. God did not catch you. God did not teach you how to fly. He allowed you to fall down. Rock bottom. Lord, sagad na sagad na talaga. I cannot do anything else. I'm broke. My wife left me. Everything else is in shambles. Why am I rock bottom? And you start questioning. I cannot see help from anywhere because I'm alone in this bottomless pit. I am on rock bottom. God's encouragement. And this is really encouraging. It encouraged me a lot. The reason why God allows you to reach and hit rock bottom is for you to realize that He is the rock at the bottom. He wants you to anchor your hope on Jesus, even if things around you seem dark, even if like the nearest light is just like miles away and you seem hopeless, nothing's going to change anymore. God is saying, do not fear. I love you. You are standing on the rock. I am, at the ro- I am the rock, and even if you're at the bottom, if you put your trust in me, everything will be okay because I love you. So the challenge, and you might have probably a million reasons to justify and tell me, no, Joe, God doesn't love me. But God will always have a declaration over your life that He loves you. He says, my love for you will never change. No matter how difficult your situation is, no matter how much problems you face, kahit gaano kagulo ang buhay mo, how unsettled your life becomes, God loves you. God's love is constant. It is there for you whether you like it or not. It will never change. It will not go away. It simply is always there. It doesn't make any difference who you are. You cannot keep God from loving you. Kahit ayaw nyo, hindi nyo siya mapipigilan. God will love you. The only difference is that we can get into a place where we will not experience God's love. Why? Because a lot of us would open an umbrella of unforgiveness, an umbrella of hatred towards someone. We'll open an umbrella of sinfulness, of lust. And it doesn't mean that the sun is not there anymore. It's still there. But the, sun of, the sunshine of God's love, we do not feel Because of the umbrella. But it doesn't mean that God doesn't love us anymore. He still does because the sun is still there. God's love is like the sun. It's constant. It's always shining brightly for us. When we are in a situation, we can only ask two questions to God. The question of why and the question of what. If God has put you rock bottom, if God has fallen your your life apart, you can ask God, God, why are you doing this to me? 
Why have I failed my exam? Why did I not get that promotion? I've been working so hard, ganito pa rin ang buhay ko. Lord, why? Why? Why and why? Now, God wants to challenge you today with this declaration saying, I have loved you. Because He wants you to trust His love for you. He wants you to come to a place of peace and calm and say, Lord, I know you love me. What do you want me to learn from this? See, there's a big difference between asking God why and asking Him what. What can I learn from this experience? What do you want to teach me? Today, I want you to make, I challenge you to make that declaration to yourself. I know God loves me. There is nothing that you can confess to God that will make Him change the way He feels for you. Nothing you confess can ever change and can make God love you less. We have to trust in God's unfailing love. Everyone in this room would probably say, if I ask you, do you love God? A lot of you would say, probably always, yes, I love God. But how many times have we failed ourselves in proving that we love God? We say we love God, but our actions, the words that we speak, they speak otherwise. The moment you get out of this door and experience the world, you're faced with challenges of either loving or hating people. And that's a reflection of your statement that I love God. Trusting God means trusting, God, trusting God's love more than our love for Him. It's mean, it means that when we pray, we should be arousing our awareness of God's love for us rather than arousing God's awareness of His love, uh, of, our, of God's awareness of our love for Him. It's the other way around. The love of God, remember this, the love of God is an exercise of His goodness towards all of us. We're all sinners. Jacob, Esau, we're all sinners. We merit only condemnation. The gospel is the only story where the hero dies for the villain. When we look at the cross, what's our only contribution? The only thing that we have contributed to the cross is our sin. Yet Jesus, while He was nailed to the cross, gasping for breath, blood flowing from the wounds on His body, He even prayed, Lord, Father God, take this cup away from me, but not my will, but your will be done. He knows that he will be going through the most excruciating, the most inhumane punishment any person could ever get. He was there dying on the cross. The son of the father dying on the cross. And he can look at each and every one of us and say, my son, my daughter, you are worth it. I'm here because you are worth it. That's Jesus saying, I'm willing to do this for you. And that is the declaration that we have to embrace today because God loves us. If you have never felt the strength and the power of God's life in your life, just look back at Jesus dying on the cross. Because the cross reflects the gravity of our sin. But the cross also reflects the magnificence of God's love for all of us is unconditional, unfailing, and everlasting love for us.